away from Arcadia. Today we are going to review Denizens of the Dreaming. This is a book that we will be referencing especially in the probably sundering, maybe shattering episodes of our Metaplot walkthrough, and we wanted to give you a brief sense of what we thought about this book when we read through it to do our research. Simon, what is Denizens of the Dreaming all about? Denizens was a late Changeling book. It was published under the Art House label. It says it's about long trods, lost and forgotten, and assumed sealed, disgorging, chthonic nightmare onto the shores of the near dreaming, and it's the beginning of the end. Clearly going to be a lead into the time of judgment, which Changeling didn't really get too much as it was kind of soft cancelled by that point. It has some history about the War of Trees, the war between the Fomorians and the Tuatha, and it has some Week of Nightmare tie-in material. That's what it says it's about. How well do you think it hit those targets? So it depends on the target. The target of, is it a Week of Nightmares tie-in? Yes, it is a Week of Nightmares tie-in. The Week of Nightmares happened. One of the splats in this book was either created by the Week of Nightmares, had their memory erased and rediscovered by the Week of Nightmares. You take your pick. One thing about this book is it's soundly centered in canon. It is the changeling piece of a major metaplot event, but it's kind of written like a Chronicles of Darkness book. Every other page is a different book, and there wasn't really a lot of attention paid to consistency. If you're, you know, buying a toolbox game isn't necessarily a bad thing, but for a book that markets itself as a metaplot touchstone is a little bit unsettling to read. And then there's the whole Chthonic Nightmares thing. One or two of these splats fall into the territory of being maybe Thalane adjacent being a little bit more Nightmare than the Slua or the Red Cap, but that's only one or two of them. Most of them are solidly playable. There's one splat in particular, the Muses, that sort of reads like the Leon and Neat the Fiona are a little bit more jealous and self-absorbed, and that's what they are. And I'm like, well, that could be a character concept for a Liana or a Fiona. Okay. So the nightmare angle is a little hard to grab. Some of the splats are kind of interesting. There are a lot of story meta plot ideas, but it doesn't really read like a canon book, even though half of it is history. The opening fiction and the entire first third of the book are meant to be setting information. The opening fiction is a weird in-universe story about a fearbolg finding a chunk of a particular Belorian she's human soul in a box and it i had to read it several times to really get a clear picture of what was going on and that was even with the character who shows up towards the end, who exists entirely just to explain everything because the author didn't seem convinced that they had explained anything at all. It's interesting that this is a late Changeling book because uh, by late Changeling, they'd kind of pushed away the idea that banality and nightmare were interchangeable. All of these denizens are supposed to be more nightmare adjacent than normal changelings, but they continually describe the Karamet as being passionless ghost things. It comes across very clearly in the opening fiction, and I 
still don't understand it. I don't I don't know what was intended or I I just don't. <laughs> Yeah, and I, another thing that I, I struggled with a little bit is this book didn't totally seem to know what the Adheen, which is what these, you know, groups are called, were supposed to be, because the first half of the book presents them as absolutely inhuman, basically true fae, basically the closest thing to true fae that you could get. They intentionally build a super alien legacy structure for them to take away any sense of humanity and then almost every splat has a write-up about whether or not they feel the need to hold down day jobs including the karamat the karamat are supposed to be dead humans that were trapped in the dreaming they're specifically pitched as dead enchanted humans or kinane or some other person that died wrapped up in glamour and so they didn't get to go to their proper afterworld and they use terms like heaven and hell but really this is the world of darkness we'll just, there's no heaven and hell the far shores are a lie they're a slave trade we all know what the shadowlands are that's fine but they're passionless so you take what would be an entity that is driven 110 percent on passion wraith and then you wrap them up in the dreaming a super wild, emotional, creative influence, and you end up with a completely passionless thing. I kind of know the stories they're invoking outside of the world of darkness, but as a game artifact that fits in the cosmology of the world of darkness, I have a really hard time parsing them. And then having that bit about, you know, whether or not they want to hold down a day job, which repeats itself in most of the splat write-ups, I had a conversation with someone and they, you know, made the comment that, oh, well, you know, maybe they were just trying to make this accessible if someone wanted to play a meat changeling version of this. But there's no real narrative intro given to contextualize that. There's a merit where you're basically a changeling, but even that is described as you have a body stowed away. It's specifically written in somewhat more alien non-changeling terms and then you're told to use the normal changeling rules so like even that doesn't go all the way there there's there just there are a lot of things like that in this book like some of the things this book did that i like narratively anyway they get into the war of trees between the tuatha and the, the fomorians and it's an interesting read that kind of contextualizes where the more like nightmarish kiths kind of fit into the too often dream. But at the same time, they also did a weird because it's World of Darkness and World of Darkness cannot get over the fall of Satan. They get this weird like war in heaven kind of metaphor. And it's just every other game has that. I'm really done with it at this point. <laughs> They do name check other pantheons existing, specifically during the War of Trees. They mentioned that the Tuatha overthrew what became the Denizens, and other demigods were involved, which is a step forward, I suppose. But it's in the same book with the first like Indian mythology splats getting introduced to Changeling, and they're... I mean, the mission statement for this book is, you know, grittier, darker, not-so-nice changelings. So it's it's an odd place to be doing that, especially as the only place they did that up to this point. That is definitely a little bit difficult. The splat that they introduced that was Indian were the children of Kali. In one part of the book, their memories are wiped out, and their homeland was destroyed. And then in another part of the book, they were very clearly created in the Week of Nightmares, as opposed to being corrupted by it. And they make a whole big thing about writing them up as very, like, childlike. And it's it's weirdly inconsistent. And having that sort of phenomenon, having a character that's experiencing that, with no way to engage with their own cultural changelings. What do the rest of the Indian fae think about these things? 
what relationship do they have with them? Because they wouldn't have this long-standing, you know, enemies of the Tuaha relationship. As soon as you have an actual Indian fairy society, then suddenly the question of are they long forgotten or were they brand new becomes a thing that just collapses in on itself like an observed photon. Like the rest of the culture will have an opinion on that. But none of that exists. And so all the things that would make that experience interesting, you don't have any of the cultural framework in Changeling to actually tell those stories unless you want to, you know, write up a whole new, like, sphere of Galen on your own. That's a big lift to ask of somebody. You're talking about the Naraka, right? Is that I, I am. I am talking about the Naraka. Yeah, even then, and I'm going to butcher this but the awari are indian like i looked up their source myth and they're sort of disease mountain hags from india and like they they could have done that lift for us there but they didn't and that's kind of it's just kind of the way this book goes they make a big deal about how the end of the war of trees was a big deal and how the silver ban and the silver paths were created then which barred the adheen from the trods or maybe it barred them from the autumn world sometimes it's one sometimes it's both but it's just constantly going back on that because in a game that mostly takes place in the real world the adheen have to be able to get to the real world and they have to be able to get to the parts of the dreaming that other changelings show up in. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. There are just so many contradictions like that on fairly large, like, should-have-been-decided points. I have a hard time imagining the four people who were involved in writing this book ever actually sat down in the same room together and talked to each other about this book. Yeah, I, I definitely got that feeling reading it as well. You know, the other thing we haven't really talked about yet are the rules themselves in the book, because it does have a fair bit of actual crunch. You know, it's a whole new type of supernatural. It isn't even really just another group of changelings. These are fae without bodies that are indigenous to the dreaming. And how do they push themselves into the real world? That's a different set of things. You have to put systems around. Some of the systems work, but they're not all that consistently described. They also introduce a lot of information about the trods of Balor. So we have these rules about how these non-silver path trods work and the rules about how the Adkeen work. We've got a few new arts. I'm not new to anyone who's read C20, but they were new at the time this book came out. Some of the rules work, but like none of the forms that the Adkeen can take allow them to call on the weird. But you get birthrights, at least one birthright, that has a whole aspect that only works when you've called on the weird. I spent like 20 minutes trying to figure out how can I actually call on the weird with one of these characters so I can like make sense of this, and I you can't. So you'll run into some things like that. One of the arts is specifically about how can these non-physical changelings influence the physical world without pushing themselves into it and exposing themselves to it. It's very limited use. But then this is also the book where we got Oniermancy, and Oniermancy opened up a concept in Changeling that it has needed for a long time. There are definitely some tidbits here that are interesting and worth using. You just have to be ready to finish the development work. The most defining ability that the Adheen get is possession, and it works like ghosts basically they can all of them have this innate ability to possess a human body there's no real discussion about how that works if they're also meat changelings but that's the way this book is for like their one really defining systematic power it's mentioned once really in the systems section and kind of forgot and even then it's a very strange construction, because on the same page they're laying out the base rules for how this works, they also have a sidebar that says, I'm paraphrasing, but if players use this the way we wrote it, you should punish them. That is a terrible attitude to take towards your players. It's not good design. I don't, 
I, I just don't understand what happened there. The thing that really confused me about that sidebar is the rule that they brought up. They were like, we recommend you punish them this way, but I guess if you don't want to, you know, uh, it's your table. And they, they do this whole weird passive aggressive thing in this sidebar, but it was about like jumping between victims too quickly and basically just abusing the fact that you use up a body when you possess it. I looked at that and I thought, okay, this is a game balance thing. Why did you write a passive aggressive sidebar? Just write it into the rules. Just come up with a narrative excuse like it overwhelms your psyche to be inside so many humans in such a short period of time, and you take this penalty if you do this. Just make it part of the rules and and be done with it. Like, yeah, it could have been <laughs> interesting. It could have been like the core of what is an adheen. It could have been like you know they have this weird reverse remembrance thing where when they jump from body to body part of it hangs on and oh no you have all of these different conflicting personalities fighting if you spend too much time in the autumn world this way and you become a mess and isn't that interesting and i would find that super interesting but they didn't they just said no you should punish your players the feeling i got at the end of this book when i'd read the whole thing was that the people who wrote this book play Changeling with a very heavy use of the golden rule, which, to be fair, most people do that, partially because Changeling needs it, partially because they're fairies, and there's a lot more unreliable narrator in Changeling than other games, and especially as soon as you go into the dreaming, you want things to be super uncertain. And I feel like the people that did this were all Changeling players, and they took the philosophy of... What sort of crazy inconsistent things do we do in the dreaming and tried to write a book in that headspace? And my view of the golden rule in World of Darkness is everyone should use it as liberally as they want. Yay, freedom at the table. But every time you end up in a situation where everyone has to pick up the golden rule to make sense of a book, you've failed. The golden rule should be an omnipresent option. The strength of World of Darkness compared to other role-playing games like D&D is that the setting is built in. You don't need to go by Eberron. You don't need to go by Pathfinder books. You just have World of Darkness, and the strength of that is, presumably, <laughs> everybody at the table has some sort of familiarity with the lore, and you have all of these things you can pick at as a storyteller or a player that everybody else kind of shares. If I'm golden ruling half of the narrative to make it fit with the rest of the narrative, that's gone. Like, nobody has any certainty that the thing they built their character's narrative around actually exists at this table. That's a dynamic that's very present in Denizens of the Dreaming. There's one final part of this book that we haven't really talked about, and that is the Fomorians. This book is the beginning of what we're loosely calling the Second Era in Changeling, and anyone who listens to our plot episodes or the other reviews will pick up on this. This is really the book that introduced that, maybe even like leading into the final C20 era, it kind of depends on how you want to slice and dice things. But this book kind of throws the old house Balor, Balor as king, you know, Lu killed him, and that being the fall of the Fomorians, it kind of takes that and throws it out the window and introduces these three Fomorian courts, one of which is incredibly conniving and political, one of which is incredibly warlike, and one of which is just unpredictable and impossible like they're just oh you can't understand them they're so weird they imprisoned themselves why would we do that no one knows they're the white court and that's literally their whole description um yeah, but they didn't do a good job of that because <laughs> like they go on to completely logically explain why they did that and it's totally believable yeah well <laughs> yes <laughs> so th this book does a really interesting thing in that it writes up these very distinct courts for the Fomorians. And to put it bluntly, they're really human. It's not the towering like ogre with one eye. It's not the undescribed nightmares from beyond space and time. The conniving political court, 
the beat the you know drums of war court and the we're super enigmatic you don't understand us but actually no this makes sense when you take a second they read like any other human myth they're very not chthonic <laughs> But you get these specific archetypes that you can invoke if you want to actually have the Fomorians show up at your table. Yeah, I get the impression that like one person involved in this book understood like the anthropological origin of like Chthonic deity, and everybody else read Lovecraft. Because there's a weird tension going on here that doesn't make any sense otherwise. Yeah, and so to take a quick moment to read that definition of Chthonic deity... The actual dictionary definition of chthonic concerning belonging to or inhabiting the underworld. And so the Adheen all fall squarely into that. We never left the dreaming. We exist in the reality under reality. By that definition, they're absolutely chthonic. The abstract horror nightmare tone, whenever the book invokes that, reads like Lovecraft. There is nothing Lovecraftian about any creature that is described in this book at any point. Ever. Even the Fomorians, when they actually get around to describing them, are just like, oh, okay, well, I wouldn't want to face that army either. They sound very into their war. Eh? <laughs> And like you said, this book is kind of a narrative pivot from Concordian politics, House Baylor is like the evil bad guys over there that we all got to worry about, to, oh no, it's the Fomorians we got to worry about. Like, it's a weird pivot that doesn't really work because of the way the Balorians were set up in the first place. Because originally they were, you know, the half-she, half-Fomorian or half furbald not quite clear on that. Bastard children of uh, hostage taking. They are ennobled. They are part of the Shi hierarchy in Concordia. And also, this book introduces some dude named Heroth who we're all very worried about. Even the other Balorians are worried about him. But then we go on to talk about his objectives, and they exactly line up with the other Balorian she, so I never really figured out why the Balorians are upset about him at all. Because, like, if he succeeds in everything, then the actual house leadership won't get any credit, I guess. I mean, there's a story there. I, similar to a lot of the other stories in this book, you have to dig for it. We could go on, <laughs> but... To be honest, this is a pretty good sampling of the experience that both Simon and I had reading this book. There are a couple interesting ideas. They are not written in a way that can be taken at face value. They have to be reshaped. The whole book requires the golden rule at some level. If you're okay with that, if you like the idea of exploring this and seeing what writers thought about changelings who never came to earth so when the shattering happened some changelings stayed on earth the nobility fled all the way to arcadia and what happened to everything betwixt the splat write-ups don't actually do a terrible job of running through that thought experiment but it's that thought experiment not what would horrible nightmares who served as the fomorians captains and generals over their thalane shock troops which is a framing that is used in the book but that framing they don't reach that level they just don't even get close to there so if you want like glorious nightmare book use the adheen write up in c20 the rules are more consistent they cleaned up the birthright so they actually work with the rules you only get a paragraph or two on each splat but honestly if you want to turn them into dark kin you're better off with that paragraph or two and doing the rest of the work yourself. If you want the thought experiment of what happened to all the changelings that never went through the changeling way but didn't make it back to Arcadia, there's some stuff here you can extract. Just like the Silver Ban, our scores don't matter. What do you think of the systems in this book? I would probably give the systems a two and a half. They are two dev passes away from being usable, but there are some ideas there that are worth finishing up on your own. 
for me, a lot of this book suffered from the problem of, well, if that works, how does the rest of Changeling work? Yeah. I think the system in this book is an interesting source of inspiration for stuff that might work at your table if you're willing to do an alternate reality version of Changeling. Yes, I will say I'm I'm given this book like a two, two and a half. The version of all of these systems in C20 are a solid three and a half to a four. The four being Onearmancy. Onearmancy in C20 is way better. But even the general Adheen rules are tighter and cleaner. They streamlined them. I read them to compare and I'm like, oh, okay, I'm not going to go to the Adheen first in general, but like I could use this. There was just a lot of confusion and sorting in the book itself. So on one hand, yeah, you you could find some ideas here that you might want to mine and reshape. On the other hand, they kind of did that work for you in C20. Yeah. For me, the system is a solid um, one. Like, it's just parts of it kind of work, but then there are other parts where even the authors admit that the system they wrote doesn't do what they want it to. And I just... I have a hard time respecting that. Is this cohesive with other dreaming products? I gotta give it a one. I have to give it a one. I I just... No, it's not. House Balor is described in a way that is bizarre. We have main kith that apparently live in the deep dreaming, but are not completely consumed by Bedlam. That's never explained. The book isn't particularly consistent with itself, and everything in here is presented as High Nightmare, but it's basically written as the gritty end of Cathane. Like, I can't even put this in pre-C20 Thalane territory. Like, it's just kind of the splat sort of tend towards, like, the Red Cap Slua tone instead of the Boggan tone. Oh no, the horror. It's a one. In the context of C20, where the Week of Nightmares probably didn't happen, that's kind of the linchpin this book's written around from a narrative standpoint. You have to do a lot of work to make this book fit after C20. There's a... I think it was in the first chapter, there was a list of other World of Darkness books that will enhance your reading experience, but they're not required. And I spent an unreasonable amount of time googling words that were not defined ever in this book but they used frequently i assume they're from a changeling book i read at one point but don't remember and also wasn't in the list but this book doesn't do itself very many favors on that front and as a point where the meta plot took a pivot a lot of the thoughts in it aren't completed and they're not in the form they will be in later in this period of the game's development while at the same time it's hanging on to dregs from the previous period in the game's development it just doesn't fit with anything else very well and speaking to the dynamic of needing to do the lift to get it out of the week of nightmares C20, again, recommending the Adheen write-up in C20, it does a really good job of taking the Week of Nightmares, turning it into the Evanescence, which is clearly what the intent was. There's even a concept of the Evanescent Adheen in this book that I'm pretty sure is where they got the term for the Evanescence. And they basically just wrote C20 as though the Week of Nightmares never happened and the Adheen came back during the Evanescence instead of a couple years sooner. You're just happier reading that. Everything about that reads more cleanly. Also, I don't think either of us like The Week of Nightmares as a plot point. (laughs) So that's something we probably should have mentioned at the top. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Okay, full disclosure, my favorite clan is the Ravnos, and I'm not ashamed. I just... There were were a lot of Ravnos tie-ins in this book that were confusing when they weren't frustrating. Which gets us into the next category was this enjoyable reading and for me it's a one because like the ravnos tie-in where ravnos got their shimistry from a gift from the unseelie court for some reason in a book that's not about the unseelie court 
But when Ravnos died, instead of that power going back to the Unseelie Court, it just set the Dreaming on fire. I don't know why that happened. It's never explained, like so many other things in this book. The part of me that really hates just being this brutal really wants to give this a two, but I, I gotta be honest, I can't. It's a one. I spent most of this book frustrated because of contradictions more than anything else. I don't have quite the same meta plot complaints that Simon does. I don't think he's wrong. It, those things didn't bother me as much. It was the places where the book was self-contradictory that took my joy out of it. I'd read something and then I'd get a few pages later and it would be directly contradicted. And that happened constantly. You know, they make a big point out of the name for the Ravnos Antediluvian that they're going to use that is the real name in the actual part of the book that talks about it. But in the opening fiction, they literally just call him Ravnos while they're in this big mythic setting. And I was just like, really? Like, Names are so central to changelings. True names are so central to changelings. And in the dreaming, we're going to call him Ravnos. Hmm. And at first I just thought whoever wrote this book didn't actually care about the Antediluvian's name at all. And it's because it's a, a vampire plot point. And then I got later on, and this was a case where like the later on text was an improvement but because I knew that no editor had bothered to fix it, I don't even care that the writer didn't put it in there. The developer didn't care enough to fix it. I, it just, I, there were so many moments I had like that where I just had to put the book down because the architectural flaws were just so much more apparent than anything I was reading in that moment. So yeah, I have to give it a one. How was the art in this book? How was the layout? This is actually one of the high points for this book. The art was really good. I liked a lot of the art. It's a later book, so it's black and white. So I can't give it a five. Five for me is like the height of first edition, original player's guide art. Obviously, it's not going to hit that threshold. But the art was really solid. I would probably give this, I'd even say like a three five. It's not quite the four that like the first book of houses was in a lot of places but the art was pretty solid it's weird for me that the art is kind of the high point for this book but it is most of it is totally decent i have issues with the perspective in some of it one of my notes was just what the fuck is happening in this picture is that an arm <laughs> but apart from that one artist who i always have problems with it's decent it's a 2.53 for me. And then what would you say about your one sentence review? Who should buy this book? The kind of person who would enjoy this book is a person who doesn't demand uh, consistency in tone, in voice, or in the outcomes of central plot elements. This is a game book for somebody who played Bioshock Infinite and thought this would have been a lot better if it was a series of mini games every time Elizabeth opened an alternate reality. My one sentence review of this is if you love Changeling the Dreaming but really prefer playing Chronicles of Darkness, you might like this book as a grab bag of ideas it doesn't fail. And I know people who play World of Darkness like it's Chronicles of Darkness, and that's a valid way to play it. If that is your modus operandi, pick up Denizens. You might enjoy it. This time when we say it, we mean it. They get better from here. We swear to God, they get better from here. This has been Walking Away from Arcadia. This was our Metaplot source review of Denizens of the Dreaming. Please forgive us.
who should buy this book? Um, 